The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. Oh, I'll talk to you today about their architecture and design of MySQL powered application. And contrary to the guy before me, I won't have a single MySQL query on the slides. <laughs> now, to start, I thought I'll, okay, I'll try to fix my slide clicker. Yes, now it works. Uh, a few words about me. If you don't know, I am a uh, founder and CEO of their Pircona. Uh, at Pircona, we help people to be successful with MySQL. We are vendor neutral, so that means we help people with all kind of different uh, uh, MySQL variants and stuff. Before that, I was a manager of high uh, performance group in the MySQL before it was owned by Sun or Oracle, so in that original relatively small company. And before that, or throughout that time, I was acting as a consultant, DBA, software developer, sysadmin, so I have quite diverse uh, technical background. And also some uh, of you may know me either by reading MySQL performance blog or looking at this uh, high performance MySQL book where I am one of the authors. Now, at Percona, what do we do out there? Well, if you think about that, we are the vendor neutral MySQL company. And by that, I mean we do really support uh, all the vendors out there MySQL, uh, Percona Server, MariaDB, uh, Amazon RDS, and a bunch of other cloud vendors, which are all slightly different MySQL variants. And I just call it MySQL for simplicity, not to go into this very long description of all the variants and names uh, we have. Now, we write a lot of open source uh, software at Pircona for uh, MySQL ecosystem being that Pircona server, uh, Pircona extra backup, which is a hot open source hot backup solution for MySQL, Pircona toolkit, which is a set of tools which a lot of MySQL DBAs are using to be more e efficient, and the Pircona XDB cluster, which is our uh, high availability solution based on uh, Pircona server and uh, Galera technology. And also, well, uh, as a company, uh, we have to make money, as strange as it sounds, in the open source space, right? Uh, and we do that through support, uh, consulting, training. We have also remote DBA services. And uh, just a couple of days ago, we launched the managed backups for MySQL. So if you are hate setting up backups for databases and doing some complicated restores if you have to have, have to, you can uh, sell that problem to us now. Okay, now about the presentation. What is it all about? It is about their architectures and how can you build a successful application based on MySQL. And I'm going to talk about essentially a few things here. What is in your toolbox as a MySQL uh, architect, what kind of questions you should uh, resolve as a team if you want to have successful MySQL architecture. And we'll also talk about some MySQL common architecture patterns which you can use uh, to build those successful applications. Now before that, I wanted to show you uh, this picture which is something I got through one of the presentations LiveJournal did about 10 years ago. Right? So this is picture from a presentation 10 years ago, quite a lot of time, right? But what is very interesting about this picture is what really we have a lot of components out there which we would also see in the MySQL applications today. You know, think you know, large-scale apps like Facebook, Twitter, or a lot of uh, a little bit smaller scale, but still large applications which use MySQL. Uh, what do we see here? Well, load balancers, right? Mm, we have a thought there. We separate the front and then the back end web servers, right? Uh, we are using memcache for, uh, for caching with MySQL. We still do this 
uh, today. We have some uh, global database where we have a shared data and uh, and sharding through those what they call that time a database clusters, right? We would assign different users to different database clusters. We call it sharding, right? And they would use the uh, read write splitting of replication, right? So we can send some of our uh, reads to the slaves while all writes have to go to a master. Right? That is all we had uh, 10 years ago. Now, what I want to uh, show you, right, why I am uh, using this 10 years old example. Well, I think this is a very uh, interesting because what it shows is that the MySQL is quite mature, right? Mature as boring, of course, but also mature as something which provides us an ability to get a very uh, safe path to building a successful applications. MySQL is not for heroes anymore, right? A lot of MySQL problems, or most of them, have been already resolved, right? There already have been applications built dealing with petabytes of data in MySQL and serving more than a billion of users, right? But what that also means, what all those problems are resolved, and if you just need a database which you know you can trust and you can build your application on MySQL is a very good choice. Most of problems in MySQL already have proven solutions, so you can essentially just follow somebody else's footstep and you know that will uh, uh, give you workable results which worked for, uh, for many years and there is no you know, hiding surprises which will bite you in the ass when you grow from 10 users you know, to 10,000 users. But of course, 10 years is a lot of time, right? And a lot of things also have changed. So what do we see uh, have changed? The very powerful hardware right, is an important change. We are now having lots of memory. If you go 10 years back to those live journal presentations, they also will talk about how powerful server with lots of memory they have, which is was 16 gigabytes those days, right? Well, now our laptops has 16 gigabytes, and we can get maybe half a terabyte of memory in relatively affordable commodity service, right? Even on uh, Amazon RDS, right, we can get more than 200 gigs uh, of memory in the instance. And those in virtualized environments, they never kind of push your memory to quite the boundaries. You also have a very fast storage. If you look 10 years back, in the MySQL space, you would uh, typically get RAID a few hard drives, maybe going up to 10. That would give us maybe 1,000 IOPS a second. Now we can get a flash with a single PCI Express card which can get uh, um, 100,000 IOPS. Well, frankly, we can stuff more of them in this box if you want to and get even more IOPS. But we don't really need that because uh, MySQL has now a hard time driving as much IOPS as those cards can provide. Right? Latency also has improved about two orders of magnitude, which is uh, uh, which, is, uh, which is wonderful, which is uh, wonderful uh, uh, specifically for MySQL because in uh, a lot of MySQL queries are resolved serially, right? So if your query has to do a thousand IOPS, often it will be one after another. So in this case, it is the latency of IO which matters, right? So if I'm doing 1,000 of IOPS one after another, with 10 millisecond latency, it will tell, tell what? Take what? 10 seconds, right? If it's 0 0.1 millisecond latency, again, 1,000 IOPS, one after, uh, one after another, it will take 0 0.1 seconds. And it will change from painful wait to essentially instant, right, from the user observer. We also get much more cores, CPU cores, that was those days, right? Again, previously it was four cores, which probably would be your, like, four sockets for a pretty big uh, uh, monster server. Those days, we get uh, 32 more cores in our commodity uh, two socket, uh, socket boxes. What also we got, which I think is very wonderful, is what software became more reasonable, right? Software is never great, right? Software always have a way to improve, right? And always catching up with, with uh, hardware. Each time the new hardware is released, there is something we can optimize to our software to make it better. 
But I would say the, the uh, software became pretty good, at least in our ecosystem. In terms of MySQL, a few years ago we had to really uh, battle. Oh my gosh, we now have more than four cores. MySQL doesn't scale. What kind of very advanced settings you have to do, or maybe you have to patch your source code. Well, frankly, that is how uh, the Percona server was born. Because MySQL would scale so horribly with a multi-core CPUs, we had to go and patch the code for our customers. We couldn't just help them with the configuration settings. Linux kernel file systems, those days, uh, they are pretty good variants exist for everything to give you, to allow you to take an advantage of this powerful hardware. Now, another uh, disruption or important change uh, is the cloud. Anybody here runs MySQL in the cloud? Anything else in the cloud? No? Okay. But what does cloud bring to the MySQL uh, environments and ecosystem? Well, what properties does it have? The first important one is their dynamic scalability, which is a very important tool, right? Previously, for many applications, I would have to work to provide the scalability planning with maybe three months lead time, because the company will tell me, hey, you know what, we need to know we have at least three, X, three months lead time, because that's how long it will take us for, to order the new service for a purchasing department, get them sheet track, and so on and so forth. Now, we can scale very quickly, right? Need more service? Okay, five minutes done. That also allows us to use what I will call a throwaway server mentality. Again, wonderful. Anybody of you enjoys troubleshooting hardware? Right? Then it sort of works, but it uh, works 10 times slower than it should, right? Or have some weird hardware problems every couple of days, or whatever it is. And support providers are usually absolutely helpless, clueless, right, or whatever less you want to use. Uh, they can't really help you. Well, at least that was a co uh, my experience, right, with dealing with uh, hardware in many cases. Now, when you're in the cloud, we don't like how we give an instance performs. Throw it away and get another one. This also means uh, what we can be very uh, agile, both in our developments and in uh, our mm, operations, as well as mm, have less uh, involved uh, uh, operation process. Now, automation is another big change. Cloud is, in many cases, used to give automation, but I like to see those as a separate things because nothing prevents you to automate things in a virtualized environment, right, or, or even with uh, physical hardware. And if you look at a lot of the successful applications those days, they would use automation on uh, essentially all their, uh, all their layers, right? On the, uh, in the stage of development, testing, uh, deployment, and the, mm, and the operation, which is, I think is a, uh, is a wonderful. Something else I didn't tell about the cloud, but I thought I should uh, mention about how those throwaway server mentality and what I say more agile operations come together. What is so wonderful? Specifically in MySQL, one of the big problems for us, right, or, or tasks is dealing with upgrades, especially major version upgrades, right, which can be disruptive. So what we normally like to do, the most safe way to do, uh, do that would be, hey, can we sort of build on the environment separately, right? And test our application on new MySQL version, right? Then move it and throw your old one. Now, the challenge in a physical server environment is money, right? So you want us to double amount of servers, right? For database. And then what are we going to do with them? That is very expensive to do that, right? In the cloud, it becomes very inexpensive because if I just need double of amount of servers for a week or two, right, it doesn't really matter, right? It just uh, uh, add a few percent of the cost to my total operating costs uh, uh, in a year. And that allows us to do those operational tasks 
much easier and much safer while keeping our costs down when we were uh, doing that before. Another important change, uh, as I see, is the new uh, languages and framework, or frameworks. The big uh, war of those days is, again, being more agile. How can we get some semi-function application uh, uh, quickly? And in this case, um, the good interesting experience for me was, unrelated to my school, is going to Startup Weekend. Did you, anyone went to any Startup Weekends? Well, what it is, it's essentially a weekend which starts uh, from Friday afternoon, right, and goes to the uh, end of uh, uh, so Sunday. And uh, you have some idea, which is typically involved some software, we, and you can build the prototype, going from idea to some prototype in 48 hours. And I was surprised how much those days we can really uh, get done in 48 hours. We can have a very small team produce really amazing applications in this very short time. Well, that's what I call uh, agile languages, right? Now, some of that stuff comes from what we now have to write a lot of system code. Do you have any developers here? Who is anybody who was doing MySQL development like 10 years ago? So when I did that, I remember everybody would start with writing their database abstraction layer in PHP, right, for example. Because you don't want to be dealing with directly that MySQL Connect, MySQL Query, right? You want some debugging, logging, blah, 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 so on and so forth, right? Everybody would write a lot of that system code, right? Whether that's MySQL or doing any other stuff. And this took a lot of time, right? Now we are not uh, uh, doing that. In many cases, we'll just use a framework, being that Ruby on Rails, right? Or in PHP or things like Symfony, right? Choose what you like, uh, frameworks, which essentially allow us to write more application-facing code and less of that uh, support or system code. We also have a lot more client-side development, right? The applications have moved with a lot of uh, implementation is done with a massive JavaScript application, which essentially just goes every so often to a backend and so to a database to fetch some data it needs, right? Instead of a massive uh, pages which are generated in its entirety on the, on the backend. And we also have a lot of less database dependence through ORM and other tools, right? Which I think is a very mm, interesting because in many applications it allows us to easily use even MySQL or some other tools. But that also is a big challenge because a lot of uh, modern day application software engineers have absolutely no clue of databases. I'm calling this function, I don't know what it does, I don't want to know what it does, I just want to work it fast and scale well, right? And then you go underneath and say, oh my gosh, that is a monster join which scans 10 million row tables and how do you even can think about that working well? <laughs> what is another change we see? Well, it is multiple clients, right? Again, in the past, I would work with applications which are essentially one client, our desktop web browser, right? Now we also have to deal with mobile web browsers or even the different size of the screens, right? Our, our tablets, which are kind of small in desktops, but not quite as small as, uh, as the phones. We also have to pro uh, often provide interfaces and apps, right? Some na native apps, whatever, iPhone, Android, tablets, uh, uh, instead of uh, web apps. And also provide the integration for the API, right? A lot, if you think about a lot of those modern applications, everybody has an API, right? So you can get the data in or you control the applications. Facebook has API, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, everybody ha uh, has that. And that all changes how your uh, uh, architecture uh, have to be provided because there are multiple of those users of your data which you have to accommodate. Now, when it comes to MySQL, we can have also a choice of multiple MySQL vendors. And I listed some of the more common ones out there. 
But really, if you look at those Amazon and uh, RDS and Google SQL, you'll find much more uh, really out there. A lot of cloud providers provide a database as a service based on MySQL those days. And they are kind of slightly different because everybody wants you to provide something more, right? So you move your data to their service and then you can't go anywhere else because they're just shoving you with a love. We also see in a lot of modern applications what we are not only using MySQL for our data needs, but we are using MySQL as part of the technologies where we operate with, uh, with the data. MySQL is pretty good transactional data store for kind of this OLTP environment, right? Think like e-commerce website or uh, whatever it is. But there are a lot of uh, other solutions which can be better at something else. If you're uh, using for caching data, right, which we can use memcache or uh, Redis, if you're using uh, something for queuing, maybe that's going to be a RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ, Kafka, right? And there's a whole of technologies out there. Then for certain uh, kinds of data, we don't really need the relational stuff, uh, but we uh, may need uh, other properties. That's where uh, Cassandra or MongoDB come in place, right? If you want to analyze the massive amounts of data in parallel, MySQL is not really doing quite well here, right? Especially out of the box, MySQL will run every query kind of serially using only single thread, right? Not even speaking about multiple boxes, which doesn't scale very well. So there is a lot of technologies which you can uh, use to supplement, right? Or use alongside with MySQL, wherever you like to look at that, uh, to, uh, to get the most efficient architecture. Now, what also has changed, and I think which is important, is the high availability options for MySQL. I believe uh, the uh, high availability is a very key topic because a lot of applications, right, a lot of the techniques we can take, hey, you know, caching or sharding, they only apply to pretty large scale applications. But even small applications often need to stay, stay up, right? That is how uh, our availability has been always important. Your enterprise like grade application, even if it doesn't cause a lot of load, still often has to have a heavy high ability solution as a part of a business requirement. So what do we have those days? Well, first we have a ma mature you know, MySQL replication. Again, it uh, has become much, much better over last 10 years in terms of manageability and in terms of causing data inconsistency and stuff like that. Now we have a set of their uh, Galera-based technologies such as Percona uh, XRB cluster, which allow you to use inner DB tables, right? The, something you probably most familiar with if you use MySQL those days, but at the same have this enterprise level uh, cluster where you have multiple nodes that you can write to any node, read from any node, and mm, not deal with, you, with this replication scenario where you write to master and then it makes it down to the slave, well, sometime, hopefully if not too much of delay, right? We have a MySQL cluster. Anybody use this MySQL cluster here? Well, the MySQL cluster is not uh, very commonly used to be frank, right? And this is technology which had uh, a bad reputation developed for a number of years in terms of uh, hard to manage and in terms of a bad performance for complicated queries, right? So it was kind of uh, pushed down as this like, sep a special solution for telecom kind of and other special use cases. But I would say over the last years, they have been doing a lot of work uh, in a cluster and it became uh, much, much better in handling uh, with complicated queries. And also because we can get there um, a lot of memory those days, the fact you have to have most of your database in memory 
to run MySQL cluster successfully is not a big limitation anymore. We also have a proprietary cloud HA. And what I mean by that is if you go to Amazon or go to other providers, they all say, hey, you know, we provide some solution of availability for MySQL. We're doing it our own way. We don't need to understand what exactly we are doing, but there is some solution for availability. Right? So that is an, uh, also an option which appeared. Now, if we are uh, looking at the solutions for uh, replication management, we also now got some mm, uh, decent, uh, decent tools out there, even in the open source space. A while back, I remember, there have been a ton of in-house tools, right? So everybody dealing with MySQL replication to, to promote slave to master and failover would uh, write their own little kind of uh, shell script which kind of work with a use case. Well, now we have a uh, much broader, uh, better integrated and tested solutions which can be MHA, uh, the PRM, continuing to tungsten we have solution for uh, uh, rep uh, replication management if you're using their software. There's also, uh, I forgot to put here the MySQL replication utilities uh, from uh, Oracle. They invested a lot of time in uh, providing the uh, utilities to simplify managing the uh, GTID-based replication in MySQL 5.6 app. Now, we have also a bunch of tools which help us to make sharding better. Anybody knows what sharding means? Okay, and the rest is asleep, right? <laughs> okay, that was a trick question, right? <laughs> so, well, sharding is, uh, is essentially how we deal with MySQL with scaling data beyond the single node, right? We often take the data, put it, uh, put it chopper in pieces, right, and put it on different nodes. Typically, we shard by user ID, right, or something like that, account ID, where we can say, hey, some of accounts go on this server and some on that server, and they are reasonably independent, so we can do that, right? Now, this also introduces a lot of, uh, a lot of problems, right, because uh, some queries may need to traverse all the data, we need to rebalance the shard, someone, and so on and so forth, all kind of this uh, uh, solutions. Now, there are a number of solutions which are emerging in this case, which are uh, looking to make this uh, better. First group uh, is what I will call not quite MySQL, because it is not really uh, the MySQL part or completely or substantially uh, original and non-open source development. We can look at the Clastrix and MemSQL, who are written from scratch, but speak MySQL uh, protocol, or ScaleDB, which is a, a separate storage engine for uh, MySQL, which is non-open source. There is a whole bunch of proxy solutions, which may help you with a sharding needs to one or other extent, sometimes through their plugins, there is uh, ScaleArc, ScaleBase, uh, those are proprietary solution. Tesora, they just went so open source uh, a few days ago, so that uh, uh, became quite much more interesting. And there is a uh, MySQL proxy, MaxScale, which Max is going to talk about right next. By the way, is it called MaxScale because of you, Max? <laughs> no. no? No comment. Yes, that's a better answer. <laughs> yeah, there is also a solution like a proxy uh, SQL. We also have a number of open source frameworks through the years, right, which help us to manage the data, uh, such as uh, VTES, Jet, uh, JetPans. Many of them would kind of came with, oh, let's say, Tumblr, right, or Google has invented this MySQL framework for sharding and it would be open source, but then it kind of uh, died off, right, because it was mainly usable for their specific case. I think what is uh, also interesting uh, here is what uh, Oracle, they are uh, doing development of MySQL fabric, which is supposed to be this uh, official MySQL 
um, a response to this sharding pro project. Uh, it is called GA, but I think it's uh, right now the functionality is quite limited. But I would be uh, watching that hopefully in, uh, in a few years it would be uh, something more mature and full of functionality to a full scale of a cluster management. Okay, now let me move on to their application or architecture questions. Now, if you want to design successful architecture, I think there are a few things you need to get right. Well, some of that is what you may need to make some right decisions early. And what does it mean? Well, there's a lot of decisions to take, right? Some of them are, have very little impact and easy to change later. It's like what kind of coffee are you going to have in a Starbucks, right? really in the long run it doesn't matter. There are some others where you decide and you have to leave those decisions for a very long time and through our uh, support and consulted practice we often run into people taking some very <coughs> bad decisions and then they come to us when they just launched an application two weeks ago and oh my gosh now it's very expensive complicated to fix and often would have a, a significant impact to, uh, uh, to their business. To give you an example, uh, I remember a company which came to us, thankfully, before the launch and say, oh, we're launching this application in two weeks and so wonderful, mm, right? We look at that and say, hey, did you guys test that beyond those, let's say, 100 records which uh, we have in a database? Well. Not really, but we have those very smart development team far, far away, so uh, don't worry. I would ask him, okay guys, uh, how much do you expect that to grow? Well, so way we are professional, we'll spend a lot of money on the AdSense and so on and so forth. We plan to have 400,000 users in two weeks. Okay, uh, I would suggest him, let us generate the test database, right, for those 400,000 uh, 400, users. Uh, that's what we did, not a big deal. And then we would go to the front page of that application. It would load four hours. Oh, four hours. Four hours, right? <laughs> Just the front page, right? So I guess, well, uh, those guys didn't quite launch, right, uh, uh, in uh, two weeks because uh, what they have designed, it was kind of pretty simple uh, architecture, but it was, uh, you know, absolutely bizarre, right? Just throw everything in a single table and you know, just do some massive uh, queries uh, on that. But with that in mind, I think it's important to note what your first architecture will not be perfect. It never is, and this is uh, mainly, uh, it's not because of, of you, right, not being smart enough. It's just because at the start point, you don't really know everything about the application. Even your business, right, or product people, most likely don't know, right? They assume, but then as you put your application in production, there will be some other things which need to be changed and so on and so forth, right? So trying to get it perfect for that scope as you understand your problem is not reasonable because that, the problem itself is very likely to change. Okay, and we spoke about the poor and expensive to change uh, choices already. Now, the other things what I uh, uh, want to talk, and this is my approach to this problem, right? So as a CEO, I have to deal with lawyers. Not what I like that, but I just have to. And how I see that is you get the lawyer, right? They provide you solution to the problem, and then you say, hey, you know what? You can pay us uh, 10 or 1,000 times more, whatever, and we'll find more problems. Uh, uh, for you, right? So to me, it's, oh my gosh, you know, sometimes you don't really uh, want to go there because those guys will find a lot of, let's say, uh, a lot of kind of problems which you don't have time to fix anywhere and which are largely re irrelevant in the grand scheme of things, right? But at the same time, if you are not working with floors at all, right? And they're not getting some decisions correctly. Well, then you may 
run into a lot of trouble with a company, right? Legal trouble and even end up with a jail. Now, with our software applications, it's a little bit different, right? Well, your job might be on the line, but uh, in, mo in most cases, that's uh, uh, where it's, uh, it's going to end, right? But if those big uh, picture important decisions which are very costly to fix, I believe it is good to uh, involve consultants, ask for other opinion because you, before you're getting those big investments. Right. I can tell you from our side, we had so many cases as people uh, came to us way too late and they have been already in a trouble, right? And uh, instead of talking early on when we designed architecture and we could help them to make the right choices, sometimes in a matter of few hours. Now, when we speak about the architecture, we want to consider a few different, what I would call dimensions. Application scale. Well, obviously, not all applications are of the same uh, scale, right? Some of us are building the next food, uh, next Facebook, and others are building maybe software for a dental office, right? Which is also quite important, but is not nearly that scale. High availability. That's another one, right? And also, I like to look at the team experience because we can all come up with all the wonderful solutions in the theory. But in the end, it's your ability to execute which counts, right? And your team may not be, uh, may be better executing some things than others. So uh, then we uh, generally approach uh, scaling, or mm, how I like to look at that. First is to avoid over-engineering. As funny as it sounds, but in, uh, in many cases, if you have somebody who understands the problem, right, and they wouldn't be in that front page to you know, takes four hours type of people, they often tend to over-engineer their application because they're so scared and they want to, to make sure the application can scale to unlimited amount of users and so on and so forth, right, which can be, uh, uh, which can be very, uh, very costly. It can slow your uh, development process, right? And also, complexity always introduces mistakes, right? So you don't want to really uh, engineer your application to be more complicated than you uh, need. But at the same time, you want to give yourself some runway because you also don't want to just run into a wall and say, oh my gosh, I see my application is keeping up with the user demand and there is nothing I can do. And what is a good way to do that is to do at least what I will call it some capacity planning, right? Few of us are really doing the perfect capacity planning, but at least uh, analyze how your application behaves. Maybe create that test database, what I'm doing. Or do some basic math to say, hey, you know what? I see what uh, my CPU usage grows linearly with number of users, right? And I'm using the CPU 5% right now. So chances are, I can still handle like maybe hmm, 10x amount of users, right? At least some of those uh, basic things so you can estimate what kind of runway you have for those uh, decisions to do something, to scale better, to shard things or to implement caching, right? Do read, write, splitting and so on and so forth. Now to the high availability. The thing to know about high availability is what the real high availability, right? I've let me call it like a military grade, right, or something space grade, is really, really expensive. Because it's really whole consuming. It's not just your software, which has to be uh, high and software uh, and uh, uh, hardware. It's also a lot about the people, a lot about the processes, and so on and so forth, right? Why? Because people are often the leading cause of downtime. At least that's what we, uh, 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 what we see uh, those days. It's not that the software started to malfunction, right? The system software or hardware just died. But it's some developer writing the stupid query, putting that in production, and it just overloads the system, right? Or some uh, DBA with a dirty fingers thinks he's in a test environment and dropping a database, right? Or running some something which uh, you know, takes us all the resources, right? 
So that is what uh, often handles. So high availability, you have to understand what if you're re really serious about high availability, that is going to, to cost you, right? And it's, it's not uh, trivial and it's still not trivial. Now I would say the medium high availability, right, is, uh, is getting a lot more uh, affordable those days if some of the solutions I uh, iterated, right? So if you just care about saying, hey, what if my server dies, I want to be able to f fail over, right? Those things you can uh, get a lot easier those days. Now, in terms of a uh, team experience, we spoke about choosing solutions, right? And think about what solutions you uh, team can support. Now, note in this case is what your developers often would know little about databases those days. Like, I mean, uh, I've been recently involved in hiring a bunch of uh, front-end or let, let's say their application developers, and I was surprised they know about the databases a lot less than 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so what I think is important in this case is what you, uh, even you are doing the development, you want to make sure you have the uh, right and a safe uh, uh, process uh, for uh, development, which is, which is a key, right? And have some tools to support that process. What we found the most uh, uh, practical, for, for example, is to ensure what we both analyze their queries, especially the new queries, which developers write, and do that in a test environment, right? First, where you can uh, uh, review them, and as well, check things out uh, in production for a different reason. First, maybe you haven't caught all the queries, and then second, there are uh, some MySQL limitations or bugs which you may run into production introducing new queries, right? That's why you want to uh, monitor that uh, out there. Uh, you can use uh, Pircona Toolkit and PT Query Digest tool, which uh, pro provides uh, that through command line interface, or you can use the Pircona Cloud tools, which is our new, uh, new web service, which, which provides that to you in uh, easy to use web interface. Now, another important thing about the team experience, right? Or an example I wanted uh, uh, to make about making, uh, making right choices. So uh, I prefer to, to run MySQL on Linux, right? That is uh, very simple. Now, uh, at the same time, sometimes we'd have some customers which, have, which run MySQL, but their whole team is running on, on Windows, right? That is where we have a lot of experience, and well, that is what we would prefer. In this case, I mean, everything being equal, I would probably uh, steer things to run in MySQL on Linux, but that may be setting that team on failure because we don't have Linux admins, right, or, uh, or uh, DBAs, right, and, and the safe approach for them may be actually running MySQL on Linux, right? That is well, the example for me how you want to be carefully taking your team experience and a proud and not just looking at their theoretical best choices, but what your team is likely to execute the best. Another piece is uh, simplicity, right? We want really to use a fewer components than possible. Obviously, right? If I can just do the stuff with a MySQL, I'm not going to put a MySQL and Mongo and Redis and Memcache right there because I will have to have experience to deal with, uh, with uh, all of them, to monitor, to troubleshoot, to implement changes and so on and so forth. And I also have an interesting <laughs> story for that. I remember a customer uh, who needed to store the logs and they say, hey, Storing the logs in database in MySQL is a bad idea. I heard Cassandra is much better for that. How much many log records do you have? Well, about 10,000 a day. Well, you know, at this point, there is probably not a big deal, right? You can uh, as much like, as write them to SQLite if you want to, right? It's 10,000 a day. Now, 
Well, anyway, I think because uh, Cassandra is cool and new and exciting something to learn, they went ahead and started running that in, in uh, uh, to Cassandra. And then I would come and visit the same guys in probably about six months and ask about that project. And they'd say, hey, you know what? Uh, yes, we're still writing those logs to Cassandra, but that developer left and he was only one who knew anything about Cassandra. So we can't really read the data from out there or learn anything from those logs, right? And that is the challenge. The more components you have, right, the more components you have to understand how you have a, a, a team experience. Another piece for me is what there is a, a safety in numbers. I mentioned before, right, that my school is frankly wonderful because there are so many people who know MySQL, right, and uh, they have tried doing almost about anything uh, with it and uh, that makes it a safe choice, right? In a number of cases, you may need to, uh, to use some exotic tool or maybe even write something your own, right? But especially if you are in the managerial position, you have to really check closely with your team and understand what is the reason out there. Because a lot of software engineers, what, at least what I deal with, they much rather prefer to run their own stuff or to go and find something which is new and exciting and, and, and exotic to implement, right? I mean, just doing whatever everything else is doing is, is boring, right? It's not as, as rewarding, right? What are you going to talk about at your next Geek Fest, right? Now, another thing to consider is I believe what we are dealing with the world where majority of the applications are really what I will call small. Right? And what do I mean by the small applications? Well, it is applications which really can run on a single database instance if you would want to, right? Especially if you don't, um, uh, if you don't, we're not including the availability uh, here. Right? And those small applications, they can be quite, uh, quite significant. I have an example for example, uh, of their internet side of a company with 200,000 uh, employees based on Drupal and MySQL. You know, business critical, they all use that all the time, right? Support team use that to look up information. 200,000 employees, right? And MySQL is like running at about 5% on the uh, utilization of hardware they provision for that. Or I know some e-commerce sites, right, which have met, uh, 10, uh, million sales a month and even more. Part of MySQL, single instance, not even uh, in a break in a sweat, right? And most of the applications and really those, not the applications like, uh, uh, like Facebook, which really need to use a lot of uh, instance wherever you use. Now, if you think about doing some math, how large can potentially such small applications be? Well, the modern MySQL instance can handle, uh, handle um, 100,000 of queries of relatively low com complexity those days. This is like, it's not like a benchmark number, right? If you go to Oracle website, they'll say, hey, they're doing million of queries a second. Yes, in some special circumstances, you are, can do a million. Really, you can. But if you're on, with more realistic cases, I would be, looking at, uh, at 100,000. If you're looking at about the users of 20 queries per user interactions, right, then, uh, uh, then you can potentially be uh, looking at about 10 million of active users, right, with medium engagement for your applications, right? Which is pretty large application, right, if you, well, if you think about that. Of course, that can significantly vary about uh, based on what your application actually does, right? But um, if it's OLTP kind of workloads, you know, reads a bit of data, change a bit of data, you can get a lot on the single MySQL instance those days. Now, let's look about some practical choices, what we can have with our MySQL architecture. Well, first, what do we start with? What is a baseline? And a baseline is a very simple, right? It's single MySQL instance with no caching, 
no HA and no kind of supplemental technologies like cache to make it work better. First, what we have to decide is C high viability. Because that is indeed the first choice for, in a lot of uh, environments, right? We can get a lot of that single MySQL instance as we showed, but hey, you know what, do we really want to have no availability if you have you know, 10 million sales every month? Probably not. So what are those simple choices we can have? We can use availability with database as a service, right? With Amazon RES or others, very simple. My availability with MySQL replication. Again, something uh, pretty simple because there is safety in numbers. A lot of people out there are using MySQL replication for high availability. It may not be perfect, but it works reasonably well. You can also use their uh, Perconex DB cluster or other Galera uh, based technologies for high ability, which again can get you, uh, uh, get you going uh, pretty quickly and see pretty simple to manage. Now, the next question you would ask, well, we dealt with high ability. We need to scale our application, right? To make it to operate on a bigger scale. What does that mean? Well, and really, uh, you typically need to deal with one or few of those, let's call it dimensions of scalability. You may need to scale reads, right? So in certain applications, as you get more users, you get more, uh, more reads. Not so much of writes. Think about things like Wikipedia, right, for example. A lot of us are reading Wikipedia, but relatively few are making edits, right? So in their case, they need to more uh, scare, uh, care about scaling reads to much more extent to scaling writes. Then we have to scale uh, writes, of course, and uh, sometimes, or in, in many cases, we also have to uh, scale data size, right? You may have same amount of reads and writes or ever-growing data, or data uh, may be uh, growing uh, disproportionately compared to, to workload. Now, before we have to get more capacity from the system, I think it's important to think about can we do something with the load? And that is, I think, is a uh, very important uh, thing because in majority of, of applications uh, we, we observe, right, they're not become just saturated evenly. You just have some those periods of time sometimes where application is not able to pick, uh, keep it load, right, user response time suffers and they say, hey, you know, it's not performing well, right. And in this case, often uh, the ideas uh, to deal with that is actually to move the load. We can move the load in space. Let's say move it to this place, uh, to the slave for uh, for reporting queries, for example, right? Can be pretty easy. Or we can all often do it by moving it in time. Let's say uh, some batch process on a building summary tables that all can be done at night, or implementing uh, queuing to accommodate for a very short term a short-term spikes. Queuing is actually is a very, very important technique uh, out there. Uh, and why is that? Well, because if you think about the theory, right, of all, uh, how, of how those kind of interactive systems operate, then you will know what requests, they came, come with what is known as random arrivals. Anybody heard about? Uh, the, uh, this approach, right? They come, well, essentially random, right? And you can think about that, well, let's say you have a store on the street, right? How do people walk in into that? Well, like an, as a random arrival, right? In average, you may have, let's say, 100 people uh, a, a, an hour, but that doesn't necessarily mean what it's, you know, every minute, like, or a little bit less than that, a person walks in. You can find out that sometimes, you know, the group of 20 people comes together, right? And then there's five minutes that nobody else comes in. And the same really happens with the database uh, uh, requests or user requests as well. They don't, uh, uh, they often uh, uh, come in, uh, in, uh, in uh, 
batches, right? And uh, essentially, there is the probability for you to have a very high number of requests within a very short time. And if you try to process them all at the same time, often uh, you will cause the uh, database overload. With a queuing, what we can do is we can postpone all of a job, right, or part of a job which is not necessary, and do it in with some delay where we can smoothen the overload. Let's give you an example with a, with a Twitter, right? When I am posting my tweet out there, I can store it in the database, which is a very easy uh, operation. But then I have to notify all of my followers, right? And if some uh, people may have millions of followers, that would be very expensive operations to do uh, on a, right, in, the, in the real time, right? And also, if there is a number of such uh, tweets happen at a very, uh, at a very short time, right, that can cause a system overload. If you can stuff that in the queue instead, then uh, you can manage the load, right? And if some of you become notified about somebody's tweet two minutes later after it was posted, most likely you don't even notice that, right? So queuing is a very important, and it's really used in the majority of uh, high-end architectures, right? Dealing with a load spike, increasing reliability, we can also uh, kind of separate the load to multiple subsystems in this case and scale what we need to do. There are many solutions for queuing. Like you can, if, even if you, uh, you want, you can do some queuing to some uh, relatively basic level in MySQL, but there are various specific queuing solutions out there such as RabbitMQ, ZeroMQ, Redis, uh, Gearman, more like a job management but also can be used for queuing. Now, scaling reads. For scaling reads, we can either use replication with uh, read, write splitting, uh, read write splitting. We can use caching, some things as memcache, or even on the MySQL, we can pre generate the data, right? With summary tables, which I would consider also something like caching. We can also use their uh, solutions like Perconex or Ruby Cluster, right? Where we can uh, read data from any of the loads. Nothing else. Scaling right. There are essentially two big approaches here for that in the MySQL world, right? We either use the functional partitioning, and what that means is we'll take the different parts of the application and put them on the different uh, different systems, right? So, for example, I can have uh, at Percon a MySQL performance blog and forums which are kind of maybe part of a big Percona experience, but I don't really have to have both databases on the same database servers. And if the load would be that high, I could potentially move them to the, uh, to the different ones, right? And many applications have something along those lines which can be easily separated uh, and uh, often provide a substantial performance uh, improvements as well as security improvements, ease of manageability, so mm, good stuff. Another one is uh, sharding, and that is essentially horizontal partitioning right across across many servers based on user account or whatever it is. Now, we also spoke about the scaling the data, right? And scaling the data typically done with uh, sharding, right? If we just can't stack more data in, in the MySQL server. But I would uh, wonder first is, how much data do you store in the MySQL instance those days, max? Anybody storing more than 100 gigabytes per single MySQL instance? More than one terabyte? More than 10? Yeah. Well, I can tell you what I have seen people storing as much as a 40 terabytes of stuff in single MySQL instance. But it is not the happiest place to be, mm -hmm. right? It's, a, it's pretty painful, right, to deal with so 40 terabytes of stuff in a single MySQL instance. I would say what this line was moving, right? If you sp speak about the, the 10 years ago, 30 seconds. 
Come on, I haven't seen 45 minutes. <laughs> okay, let's check the watch. Wow, more. those guys, my watch is wrong, okay. Sorry about that, I'll speed up. Okay, it's completely put me out of balance. How did I mm, misset my watch? Anyway, so uh, this boundary was moving mm, through, the, uh, through the years, right? And maybe 10 years ago, I would put that in about 100 gigabytes. Right now, it's getting closer to, to 10 terabytes in the best case scenario. And I wanted to explain why, what has changed in the MySQL uh, recently, right? Dealing with much more uh, data. Well. We have an online schema change, right? So we don't have to really take a downtime to manage uh, our database and loss it anymore. It's either online schema change in MySQL 5.6 plus, or we get in PT online uh, schema change, right, for earlier versions. We have fast backups. It can be either binary backup, super connector backup, MySQL enterprise backup, or file system support. A lot of volume managers, Sun, whatever can allow you to take a very fast backup those days. We have fast network. 10 gigabits are getting pretty affordable, right? Or at least we have a service which have, you know, four network ports or so, which we can trunk together and get maybe four gigabytes of bandwidth or so. We have high performance storage with SSDs, right? They can uh, read uh, 10 terabytes, right, to write uh, pretty quickly. And we also have a, uh, the compression. There is an InnoDB compression which can give you about uh, 2x, or you can use TokoDB, which I think is an amazing technology in terms of compression where you can get uh, 10x, right? That's what we really see in, uh, in production for real data. So as a summary, I think it's wonderful that MySQL is mature and there are solutions uh, available for uh, many projects. And if you're just making a few right choices in the very beginning, you will be uh, on the good path because both the hardware and the software advances allow us now to achieve a lot with a very uh, simple architectures. Now, if you guys want to learn more right, about the MySQL, we have an uh, amazing amount of stuff in the Percona technical webinars which are available online. The schedule for next month is as this, right? If, and uh, there are also a, a recording back to, I think, two years, we have at least like tens of recorded webinars. And that's it. Sorry for running out of time. It won't happen again. <laughs> Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.